Hello, everybody. Hello. How are you today? Good. Why do the lights feel different right now? It's been way too long. Maybe that's what it is. Ah, uh, well, now we can really begin. Good to see you, James. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got a few things at the top, so please bear with me, and, uh, and then we'll get right to your questions. Uh, first on uh, Turkey. The United States condemns today's horrific bombings in El, Ar in El Aze uh, and Bitlis. Our friend and ally Turkey has suffered several outrageous terror attacks this week, including today's, the August 15th attack in Diyarbakir, and that killed seven people, one of whom was a child, and yesterday's attack in Van. Uh, we offer our condolences, obviously, to the families of all those uh, victims, and we wish a speedy recovery for those that are wounded in attacks, and it's a grim reminder of still the, the threat uh, from terrorism that the Turkish people continue to face. Uh, on travel, uh, I do want to announce that the Secretary will be traveling uh, next week. He'll travel first to Nairobi, Kenya on the 22nd of August to meet with President Kenyatta to discuss regional security issues and counterterrorism cooperation, as well as other bilateral issues. Uh, he'll also meet uh, with the Kenyan Foreign Minister and other regional foreign ministers to discuss key challenges in East Africa, including the prospects for resumption uh, of a political process in South Sudan and support to Somalia's political transition and ongoing fight against al-Shabaab. Uh, he'll also have the opportunity while there to meet with participants of the Young African Leaders Initiative and the Mandela Washington Fellows programs. The Secretary will then travel to Sokoto and Abuja, Nigeria from the 23rd to the 24th of August. Uh, there he will meet with President Buhari to discuss counterterrorism efforts, the Nigerian economy, uh, uh, the fight against corruption, and human rights issues. In Sokoto, the Secretary will deliver a speech on the importance of resilient communities and religious tolerance in countering violent extremism. And while he's in Abuja, uh, he'll meet with a group of uh, adolescent girls who are working to change community perceptions that devalue the role of girls in society. Uh, he'll also have a chance to meet with northern governors and religious leaders. Finally, from the 24th to the 25th of August, he'll travel to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, for a series of meetings with senior Saudi leaders, his counterparts from the Gulf Cooperation Council, the United Kingdom, and the United Nations Special Envoy for Yemen. His discussions there will focus primarily on the ongoing conflict in Yemen and the efforts to restore peace and stability there. Uh, additionally, we expect that the leaders will discuss, obviously, the region's most pressing challenges, including Syria and our global effort to counter Daesh and violent extremism. Finally, uh, I want to update you on uh, the issue of uh, the uh, portions of video missing from a press briefing here on the 2nd of December uh, 2013. Now, as you know, this is something we've talked about before. I promised you that I would update you uh, when uh, we had completed our review. We've done that, so if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll give you what I have. As you know, when this matter came to light, many of us, including Secretary Kerry, had concerns and questions as to how and why this had happened. And so, at the Secretary's request, the Office of the Legal Advisor spent the last several months looking deeper into the issue. All told, they have spoken with more than 30 current and former employees at all levels of seniority, and they've gone through emails and other documents to see what information might be available. They have now compiled their findings and a description of their process into a fact-finding review, which has been provided to the Secretary. We're also sharing it today with Congress and the Inspector General. Here's the bottom line. We are confident the video of that press briefing was deliberately edited. The white flash that many of you have noticed yourselves in that portion of the video is evidence enough of human involvement. Indeed, a technician came forward, recalled making the edit, and inserting that flash. What we were not able to determine was why the edit was made in the first place. There's no evidence to suggest it was made with the intent to conceal information from the public. And while the technician recalls receiving a phone call requesting the edit, there is no evidence to indicate who might have placed that call or why. In fact, throughout this process, we learned additional information that could call into question any suggestion of nefarious activity. In addition to the fact that the full video was always available on Divots and that the full transcript was always on our website, the video was edited in a choppy manner, which made it obvious that footage was missing. We also found that the video likely was shortened very early in the process, only minutes after the briefing concluded, and well before the technician who recalled making the edit believes the request was made to make the edit. And in any event, 
before the technician would have been involved in the video production process. It is possible the white flash was inserted because the video had lost footage due to technical or electrical problems that were affecting our control room servers around that time. Finally, we have confirmed that even if the video was edited with intent to conceal, there was no policy in place at the time prohibiting such an edit. So upon learning that, I think you know, I immediately put a policy in place to preclude that from ever happening. We will also be consulting now with the National Archives and Record Administration about whether any changes to our disposition schedules should be made to address the press briefing videos. Disposition schedules are rules governing um, the uh, record, official record keeping. The current disposition schedule notes that the written transcript is a permanent record. Now, I understand that these results may not be completely satisfying to everyone. I think we, will all, we would all have preferred to arrive at clear and convincing answers. But that's not where the evidence or the memories of so many employees about an event which happened more than two and a half years ago have taken us. We have to accept the facts as we have found them, learn from them, and move on. The Secretary is confident that the Office of the Legal Advisor took this task seriously, that they examined it thoroughly, and that we have indeed learned valuable lessons as a result. For my part, I want to thank them as well for their diligence and professionalism. We are, and, and I think we will be, going forward, a better public affairs organization for having worked our way through this. With that, let's take questions. All right, well, before we move on to Syria, let's, let's round, finish up this uh, videotape uh, episode, or at least dig into it a little bit more. Can you remind me just from that lengthy uh, statement, you, you think it was not nefarious because it was done badly and because it was done quickly? Is that the essential argument? I said that uh, we, weren't, we aren't sure whether it was done uh, with intent to conceal or whether it was done as a result uh, of a technical problem. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is, Brad, it was inconclusive. Some of the additional information that, that, that um, does uh, lead us to think um, that a glitch is possible here uh, is because of the choppy nature of the cut, which is when, look, when we do daily briefings, we always cut the top and the bottom, right? So we, we have an ability to do editing on the, the beginning and the end of a briefing. Obviously, we have to do that. Um, and we have procedures in place to do that in a nice, smooth, clear, very deliberate way so that when we post the video uh, of today's briefing, it, it looks like a, to a totally encompassed, uh, very professional product. So we have the ability to do this in a very professional way. This cut was not done that way. It was, it was done in a, a choppy uh, fashion that's not consistent with the way we typically do that. I'm not saying that that means for sure it was the result of, a, a, of an electrical problem. I'm just saying that it certainly gives us pause, and we have to think about that. Uh, the other aspect um, uh, of this is the timing. So roughly 18 minutes after the, the, the briefing was concluded, um, uh, the video that was uploaded was shortened, shortened shorter than the actual briefing itself, um, which would convey that uh, a cut of some kind was made very, very quickly after the briefing, sooner than when the technician remembers, much sooner actually, than when, than when the technician remembers getting a phone call uh, asking for the, for, for the cut to be made. So again, you, so we may be dealing with a memory issue, and maybe, that, maybe that's inconsistent, uh, or maybe there was, uh, uh, you know, there, there could have been a, a technical problem that caused the video to automatically be shortened um, uh, when, it was, when it was first uploaded so quickly, 18 minutes after the briefing, which is pretty fast. So it's not impossible or inconceivable that there was an intent to conceal information. In other words, nefarious intent here. We're not ruling that out. Uh, but we also cannot, based on the evidence uh, that we have gained, rule out the possibility uh, that, there was, that there was some technical problem and then to make, to make it known that, that a cut had been made, a white flash was inserted. But there were no technical problems on the other videos that still exist. Right, but if, they don't. If that were the case, don't you think someone would come and admit that rather than nobody of the 30 witnesses you interview can actually remember what happened? It seems like such a ridiculous explanation. It shocks me that you're actually providing it here. But, okay. 
Is that a question, or, uh, or you just want to berate me? Well, no, I, I, John. I just think it's uh, I think it's really strange that you're you're saying that. Um, I think someone would remember if it were a technical glitch. And why, how could you say there is a technical glitch? There's a possibility of that when there's no other evidence of those glitches on the other videos that exist. I'm okay. saying I can't rule it out, Justin. There's also no evidence that anybody did this uh, with an, a deliberate intent to conceal. We just don't know. And, you might, and, and I understand, look, as I, said at the, as I said at the end of my lengthy statement, uh, that I understand that the, 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 that the inconclusive nature of the findings is not going to be all that satisfying to you. It wasn't all that satisfying to the rest of us. You don't think that we would like to know exactly what happened? But we, we just don't. They interviewed more than 30 current and former employees. They looked at, 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 uh, uh, at emails and records, uh, and there simply wasn't anything to make a specific conclusion here. Let's put our satisfaction aside for a second. Is this, uh, is this conclusion that you've reached, whatever it concludes or not, is that satisfying to the IG? Is the IG now done with his investigation? Well, I'll let the IG uh, speak for themselves. I'm not aware that the IG has taken this up as uh, well, uh, to the investigate. The review, sorry, that you've you've called it. We, what I can tell you is, again, I, I cannot speak for the IG. As you know, they're an independent entity. What I can tell you is that the Office of the Legal Advisor uh, kept the IG informed uh, uh, as they were working through the, the, the process. And uh, it's our understanding that they're comfortable with uh, the work that was done. And then lastly, the, the technician, um, is there any uh, punishment to him, or I think it's she's been referred to as her in the past, uh, to her um, as a result of cutting the tape, not remembering who told her, not remembering any of the details regarding this? No, there's nothing to punish anyone for. Okay. As I said at the outset, there was no policy prohibiting this kind of an, uh, uh, of an edit. There is now, but there wasn't at the time. So there's no, no wrongdoing here that, that could be punished. James. Can we stipulate in advance of my questions that uh, in pursuing them, I can be absolved of any charges of solipsism or self-centeredness. You have to define solipsism. <laughs> Believing that oneself is the center of the universe. Um, I just happen I to be... I would never think that of you. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to have that on the record. Uh, first of all, uh, so that we are clear, what you are telling us is that some unknown person called this technician to request that an edit that had in fact already been made by some unknown force be made again? What I'm saying is, James, we do not know. Uh, we have, uh, we have the, the, te the technician who has recalled getting a phone call to make an edit to the video. Uh, and the technician stands by the recollections of that day. Um, but the but it's had already unclear. been made. Well, it's, it's unclear. Again, 18 minutes after the briefing, we know that the video uploaded, to, to the version that was uploaded to be used on YouTube and our website was shortened by the same amount of the cut. Um, now, it's unclear how it got shortened. It's unclear whether that was the result of, of an electrical malfunction or was the result of uh, a deliberate, physical, intentional it is the edit we've all edit. seen. It is. OK. And, and what so was inserted, the, the technician did remember getting a phone call, did remember inserting a white flash to indicate that video footage had been missing, so we know and the white flash is very clear evidence, as I said, of human involvement in the process. But we're dealing with recollections and memories that are two and a half years ago. And I don't know about you, but I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So, I mean, there's, you know, there, there's, you have to allow for some of that here. And that's why it's inconclusive. I'm not at all standing up here telling you that I'm confident um, that the, to, to phrase it your way, that there was a, that a call was made to make an edit that had already been done. I just don't know that that's what happened. What is the time gap between the uploading in the video and the time when this technician recalls that call having come in? Uh, let me see if I can find that for you. And does the video automatically upload to the website? No, it doesn't. So it's possible that someone could have done the edit before it was uploaded. Hang on a second, Ross. I'm trying to answer one question at a time here. Look, I, James, I just don't have that level of detail. I, I said think, it's quite I some time, yeah. weeks, months, a year. What, what do we think it was? No, it's usually, um, it can take up, uh, up to a day uh, uh, to get uh, the press briefings, you know, uploaded online. Um, 
it, it just depends. And, and so I just, I just don't have that level of detail. Um, in arriving um, at the conclusion that you're unable to make a conclusion as to whether nefarious intent was involved here, um, it seems that nobody has taken um, into that assessment the actual content of the briefing that was actually erased or wound up missing. Uh, and so I want to ask you point blank, doesn't the content of the missing eight minutes tell us something about the intent? Uh, it just happens to be, in fact, the one time in the history of this administration where a spokesperson stood at that podium and made statements that many, many people across the ideological spectrum have interpreted as a concession that the State Department will from time to time lie to preserve the secrecy of secret negotiations. <laughs> that coincidence doesn't strike you as reflective of some intent here. Again, James, two points. First of all, uh, the results of the, the work that we did uh, are inconclusive as to why there was an edit to that day's press briefing. I wish I could tell you exactly why and what happened. But, hang on, please. But I don't know. Um, uh, certainly there was, uh, as we work through this, I mean, everybody's mindful of the content of the the Q and A that was missing uh, from the from the video. I think we we're all cognizant of of that Q and A. Um, uh, I can go back certainly and look, but it's my understanding that the content, the issue about the content, had been discussed in previous briefings. It wasn't the it wasn't the first time um, that that particular content had been discussed. Number two, as I said, it was always available in its entirety on divots, uh, and it was always available in the transcript. So. Uh, if again, if somebody was deliberately trying to excise out uh, the, the Q and A regarding that content, um, uh, it would it would have it, it would be a pretty ham-fisted and sloppy approach to do it because the transcript was never not complete and the Divids video was always complete and there were hang on a second and there was um, uh, media coverage that day regarding that exchange, right? And I so it well. I'm sure you do. So, uh, so it, it wasn't as if um, the content inside that eight minutes or so was not available to the public immediately that afternoon. Two final areas here, and I will yield. I appreciate your patience. Um, nothing in what you've said so far today suggests that the contents of this investigation or its conclusions would be classified. And so when you tell us that uh, the, the report uh, done by the Office of the Legal Advisor is going to be shared not only with the Secretary but with members of Congress, what is it that prevents you from sharing that full report with the public? Nothing. And we have, uh, uh, we, we intend to uh, make sure uh, that, uh, that you get access to it. We're still working through log logistics with that. But, that but nothing precludes that. And we look forward to a timetable when um, you can make it public. Uh, lastly, um, did the Office of the Legal Advisor arrive in the course of this review uh, at any conclusion as to whether this video itself constitutes a federal record? Well, again, as I said in my opening statement, we're working now with uh, the National Archives and Records Administration uh, to take a look at what I've called disposition schedules, the rules governing what is and what is not considered uh, a public record. Uh, but at the time, and as of today, uh, the, the transcript is considered a, a permanent record, uh, official record of these daily briefings. So the answer to my question is the Office of the Legal Advisor did not make any determination as to whether this video constitutes a federal record, yes or no? No, and that wasn't okay. their, first of all, James, that wasn't their task. Uh, their task was to try to find out what happened, and B, it's not up to the Office of the Legal Advisor to determine what is or what isn't a permanent official record. Uh, that's determined by NARA, and that's why we're consulting with them right now. The videotape in question was shot with a State Department camera, correct? Yes. It was uploaded to the State Department website by a State Department technician, correct? Yes. The State Department website is maintained by State Department employees, correct? Yes. This, this video uh, um, on the State Department website is in a separate place on the website from the transcript, correct? Yes. One has to push a different button to access the video from the button that one pushes to access the transcript, correct? Uh, that's my understanding. I have no further questions.
Just to make sure. I, I, it sounds like a federal record to me, John. It would be very counterintuitive. It would be very counterintuitive to, to imagine. Let James talk. It seems very counterintuitive to imagine that a videotape of, 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 a, of a State Department briefing that is shot, uploaded, maintained by federal employees would not itself be a federal record yeah. considered distinct and separate from the federal record that is the transcript, which is typed by separate employees and maintained on a separate place in the website. So look, let me address that because it's a fair point. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, there's no requirement for us, no requirement, even today, to upload videos of this daily press briefing on my website, our website, or on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. We do that as a courtesy. Uh, well, there's no requirement to do that, um, and that's one. Number two, the entire video was also streamed into the Divots program, which is a different channel. I'm not a technician, but it's a different, completely different channel, which is why Divots had it complete without any problems. Um, and, of course, the transcript is, is uh, and we have considered the transcript as the official record of these daily briefings. And we consulted NARA at the outset of this process, and they concurred that, in their view, the transcript uh, is an official record of these daily briefings, but they're also willing to talk with us about going forward whether or not we need to take a look at those disposition schedules to see if, if, that, if that definition needs to be expanded to include videos. So, James, we actually asked ourselves the very same questions you just interrogated me on. And we're working, uh, and I mean that in a, you know. Not with the same panache. No. Okay. <laughs> not, not, with, not with the same self-centeredness. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but honestly, we, we asked ourselves the same questions. In fact, we, we still are, James. And so we're working with uh, the National Archives on this, and we'll see where that goes. So let me get this straight. If, if the Divid's video was the same, shot by the same camera, it's the same thing, and it had no problems, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding why you would assume and conclude that it's so possible that your version would have some technical glitch that needed to be edited. I thought we got past the, it was a technical glitch line. I'm really surprised to see that back in the narrative because if their version's clean, why? It's a different, first of all, it's a different system. It would system. be highly unlikely, John, that, that there would just be some minor problem on your end. It seems implausible and not worth mentioning as a defense. It, it, Justin, look, I, I, I'm not going to dispute the confusion that you're having over this. I can tell you, as I said, we would have all preferred um, that there was some clear, convincing evidence of exactly what happened. But there isn't. I can't make it up. I can't, I can't just pull out of thin air. Uh, an exact reason for what happened. Well, so, I, so because I can't, but because I can't, and because the Office of the Legal Advisor couldn't, based on interviews, based on looking at documentary evidence, we can't rule out the fact that there were, and there were some server problems that we were having around that time. I can't tell you with specificity that it was on that day and at that hour, but we were having some, some problems, and it's not out of the realm of the possible uh, that the white flash was inserted uh, rather for nefarious purposes, but more to indicate that there was some missing footage and we wanted to make that obvious. All the evidence. Who would come to the technician 18 minutes after the briefing and say, I noticed that there was a technical, telling the technician there was a technical problem. It just doesn't seem. This technician is not, uh, this technician does not work in the office that typically edits the daily briefings. Um, look, Justin, I can't just, possibly... It was someone within public affairs, not in the technician's office, who instructed yeah. the change be made. That's what you guys have said. And the idea that that person We've said that would that have noticed some, recall. would have some knowledge of a technical glitch that the technician needed to be instructed on, all of it seems totally implausible. That's not a question. Okay. I have but a all I can say to you is I can't answer the question you're asking. We have tried to answer the question you're asking, and we have spent many months now working on it. And it's the, uh, the results are inconclusive in that regard. I can't change that fact, and that is a fact. I just have a, a clarification one, point, one, just real quick. Hang real on quick. just a second. Hang on just a second. One quick. I, yeah, mine's a minor point, too. Um, just one, one thing.
from another person. Other than the immediate group there. We've jumped around this issue Are and around it. Are you separate from the media group here? I, I'm different from the immediate, immediate group. Oh, the immediate group. So, so this sounds like a very thorough internal probe. Uh, more than two dozen people interviewed. Did the probe identify who from public affairs made the call requesting the change? Yes or no? No. Was it unable to do it? Unable to do that. Sorry. Can you just remind me? Um, I just need to clarify these things. The request to the technician was to do what? I recalled it was to cut the tape. The technician recalls getting a phone call yes. from somebody in public affairs uh, to edit the video. That That is still the memory of the technician, and that's reflected in the, in the review. So right. why did the... So what did they edit if it was already, if this section of the tape was already missing, what did that technician actually do? The technician remembers uh, getting the phone call and inserting a white flash uh, 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 to mark the fact that the video had been shortened. So, it's a, so the, the request was to edit the video and then the technician decided upon herself to insert a white flash as a transparency the, flasher or the something? The technician recalled uh, uh, inserting the white flash uh, so that it was obvious that uh, a cut had been made. But the request wasn't to insert a white flash. The request was again, to cut the uh, video, again, wasn't it? I'm not disputing that. That is, so what, that is what the technician why remembers getting a call. very Hang obedient on. Hang and on. forgetful technician? Hang on suddenly decide they were going to insert the white flashes. The technician remembers getting a call to edit the video, um, uh, has recalled and come forward and said that the that, that edit was made and that a white flash was inserted. I, I can't, I'm not, I'm not at all, and we're not disputing uh, the, the, the recollections. As I said at the outset, um, in working through this, additional information came to light, uh, which, uh, which also forces us to consider the possibility mm -hmm. um, that there might have been uh, a, a technical problem here um, that truncated, shortened some of that video since so shortly after the briefing, 18 minutes, which is, which is much faster than we, we typically get to uh, compiling this and, and posting it in, in an, on, a, on a normal day, um, happened. So um, no, nobody's challenging um, the account, um, yeah. and, uh, but it's because because we have uh, uh, additional information um, that we've now uncovered I, that, that make, makes it inconclusive on our part. I just have two more questions. Um, one, did the technician indicate where she came up with the white flash idea? Was that just being really enterprising? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I, then, as I understand it, um, or so I've the, been told that that yeah. is not an unusual uh, okay. Procedure for for uh, for making a deliberate okay. cut uh, and to make it uh, obvious, but I don't. I'm not an expert. Why didn't uh, Why did nobody in your entire apparatus think of using the good tape that was sent to the divots and just using that? I, I don't have an answer for you on that. Again, it was always available on uh, on uh, divots, and I'm not. I wasn't here at the time, so I don't know um, how much visibility there was. Uh, above the technician level on this and, and, and that technician supervisor, I just don't know. But if, if, if the white light was meant as some sort of uh, effort at transparency, one, you would have said something, probably indicated somewhere when you posted it, missing tape, no? Not let people hopefully see a white light I, and divine I, I what that means. I can't go back. Secondly, wouldn't you just use the good tape and just... Brad, I, I can't go back two and a half years here and, well, yeah, and try to get in the heads yeah, of, of people that... you raised this, like, but, spectral theory that maybe everybody did everything perfectly and we just misinterpreted it. No, I did not, and I never called it a spectral theory, okay? I, uh, what I'm saying is I, I can't go back two and a half years I, uh, and, and try to relitigate the decision-making. The, the technician remembers getting a call, making a cut, inserting a white flash, talking to the supervisor about it. Uh, conversations that happened uh, above that level, I simply can't speak to because I don't know. Um, and it, it would be great if we could, you know, go back and, and rewrite the whole history on this, but we, we can't do that. All I can do is is learn from this and move on. And now we have a policy in place that no such edits can happen without my express 
uh, permission and, and, and approval before before it happens. And as I said, there was no policy at the time against this kind of thing. So there's that's no true. wrongdoing. Are we done on the video? No, no I have one more. Just, just to wrap this up, because you just said that edits cannot be made without your express knowledge and consent. What is the workflow now for recording these videos of these briefings and other events and uploading them to the website. What is the, the basic workflow, workflow? The workflow hasn't changed. The workflow is the, it's the same procedure that's been used in the past. And, and again, I'm not an, an expert on the, the way uh, our technicians, who are very professional and very competent, do their jobs. Um, I didn't change anything about the process except to insert um, uh, a rule that um, there will be no editing of briefing, press briefing videos without my express consent and approval beforehand. But I did not change the process. That's understood. But I will say as someone with 24 years in news, television news, there's always another pair of eyes looking at what someone does in terms of work. And so I'm asking, one, once you record a video, now that everything is digital, it's pretty easy to upload things pretty quickly. You don't need 24 hours. Number two, if you are uploading something, there's going to be someone in the process, a media manager, a producer, an editor, who's going to verify that the work was done and that the work didn't have any technical glitches. Who is checking up on the work of there the technician? Is, or is the technician simply working and ticks off a box, no, I've done this task, and there is a There is a process there, that, that, uh, uh, that supervisory personnel are involved in. I don't have the exact... Uh, you know, uh, flow chart for you here today, but I'm comfortable that the process works and it and it and it works every day. It's going to work today. It worked yesterday and it worked uh, the days before that. Uh, I'm not worried about that. I think everybody understands our obligations and our responsibilities. Uh, I can't speak for the the, uh, the the specifics in this digital environment. Again, I'm not a technician. I'm not an expert at this. But I'm comfortable that our staff is competent and trained, have the resources available to do this in a, in a professional way, and that they'll continue to do that. Just a few last ones. Thank you very much, John. Um, do you stand by the statements you made when you first started briefing on this particular subject that this entire episode reflects um, a failing uh, to meet your usual standards for transparency? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I, again, we don't know exactly what happened here, um, but, uh, but obviously we, uh, 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 we would never condone an intent to conceal if that's in fact what happened. Now, we, again, I can't say that that happened, but if it did, then yes, obviously that would, uh, that would not uh, meet our standards. And frankly, and if I might add, um, it didn't meet the standards of my predecessors either. Uh, uh, Jen Psaki, Marie Harf, Victoria Newland, uh, none of them would ever abide by uh, any kind of intent to conceal uh, information from a daily briefing. The reason I ask is because when you started briefing on this subject in May, you told us that this wasn't a glitch, that it was an intentional and deliberate erasure. Now, following the investigation by the Office of Legal Advisor, you seem to be retracting that and saying we honestly can't say one way or the other. And so if your previous comments were to the effect that this represented a failing of transparency, I wonder if you would like an opportunity to retract those I as said, well. I said at the time that it was a deliberate intent to edit, and I said it again today. I mean, obviously, there's human involvement here. Okay. So we know, that, we know that there was a deliberate edit to the video. What I can't say based on the work now that they've done, is why that occurred. Well, but, if it, but, but, but James, if it was, and, and we may never know, right? But if it was an intent to conceal information from the public, that's clearly inappropriate. Uh, you mentioned that more than 30 employees were interviewed as part of this process. Were those interviews recorded or transcribed? Uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know. You stated that those 30 employees ranged the gamut of seniority. Uh, does that, are we to in interpret that remark as uh, an indication that the secretary himself was interviewed? The secretary was not interviewed for this. To your knowledge, did any of the people who were interviewed uh, have counsel with them while they were interviewed? I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have and to consult the Office of Legal Advisor for that. To your know. knowledge, did anyone refuse to take part in the investigation or be I know of no refusals. Thank in you. fact, the Office of Legal Advisor uh, made very clear that they were uh, very uh, grateful and, uh, and appreciative of the support that they got from people that work in public affairs today and 
uh, people that have worked in, uh, in public affairs in the past. Thank you. Afghanistan for the um, uh, investigation papers. You're, are you aware of that? Do you have any I've comment? seen the press reports on that. I don't have a comment on that. Sure. Okay. I think Carol has Actually, the I'd like to ask one more question about the table. John, how confident are you that the 30 plus people who answered these questions uh, were truthful? Uh, did you, at least to the best of their knowledge and the best of their memory, did you ask? Well, look, them I didn't to conduct. I, can, lie detector tests? I didn't conduct these interviews, uh, Carol. Uh, I wanted this uh, uh, from the outset. I wanted uh, an independent look at this. And that's why, in the in the preliminary uh, review, I asked the Office of Legal Advisor to take this on, and that's why the Secretary uh, followed up and asked them to to dig deep deeper into it, so that it was outside my bureau and outside of my purview. I got you. Hang on, just a second. I'll come to you. Um, uh, so I I didn't get involved in that. Um, as I said to my answer to James, the the, the Legal Advisor's office uh, felt. Um, very, very comfortable and confident that they had gotten all the support that they needed and cooperation that they needed. Um, and I know of no instance in which they thought or felt in any way uh, that anyone they spoke to was being less than completely candid and honest with them. Syria. Syria. Afghanistan. Let's go to Afghanistan here, and then I'll, I'll promise I'll go to Syria. Thank you so much. Uh, any comment about Independence Day in Afghanistan? And do you think that uh, Afghanistan has their own independence when we get our independence from the Taliban? Uh, are you asking? Do I Independence Day? Any uh, statement issued? Well, look. I mean, State obviously, Department? Afghanistan is a sovereign country, uh, and. Uh, and uh, we congratulate them uh, on, the, on the anniversary of, of independence. But more critically, I, I just – our message to the Afghan people and to the Afghan government is that their future matters to the United States um, and that, as we have long said, uh, we intend to be a partner. We intend to be a friend uh, on many levels, not just a, from a security sector, but from a diplomatic, economic, uh, and, and a political uh, level of effort. And that's not going to change. Just a quick follow. Uh, just a quick follow on Afghanistan. Uh, people of Afghanistan in the last 93 years, they have gone ups and downs from one regime to another. Now, in the last 30 years, uh, uh, they were freed by the U.S. from the Soviet uh, occupation, and now they are under the occupation of Taliban and uh, and Al Qaeda. And what they are asking is, if if and when are they going to be free from these terrorists? I mean, Goyle, I, I, I can't possibly put a, a, a date certain on, uh, on uh, the elimination of the terrorist threat in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, as we talked about at the opening, isn't uh, – you know, I mentioned Turkey – isn't the only country that, uh, that continues to face a very real threat uh, uh, from terrorism. And we know that groups like Daesh are trying to uh, expand their influence there. Uh, and we know that not every member of the Taliban has uh, and is willing to embrace the political process moving forward. Um, that's why it's important that, uh, that the United States uh, continue to make clear our intention uh, and our support uh, of, uh, of a strong, uh, sovereign, secure, stable Afghanistan. As a matter of fact, uh, the Secretary spoke with both President uh, Ghani and uh, Chief Executive Abdullah just this morning um, about um, uh, the importance of continuing to move forward with the political and economic reforms that uh, that they're trying to uh, that they're trying to to uh, to enact, and that um, that all those reforms, and we understand that they are hard to come by, um, uh, uh, will be key to trying to get to that kind of future in Afghanistan. You think Pakistan playing a positive role in uh, in this process? In Afghanistan? I, I, we've talked about this before. Look, Pakistan is uh, 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 and must be a, a, a key uh, partner in the effort because they share a long border with Afghanistan um, and they share common threats and common challenges. And there have been times when Pakistan and Afghanistan didn't see eye to eye on every issue, and there have been times when they have found ways to work together, and we continue to, uh, uh, to stress the importance of a strong bilateral relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Thank you. Go to Syria, Syria please. Okay, Syria. Okay, Syria. Okay, Syria. okay, Syria. I got you. I got you. Syria. We're going to go to Syria. Go ahead. Okay. I have a very quick question. I'll okay. come back to you later. On later. Afghanistan. Go ahead. Okay. On Syria, today marks the fifth anniversary since the President of the United States, Barack Obama, 
said that I said must step aside. I wonder if you have any comment on that. Was it an ill-advised policy at the time? Is it an ill-advised policy today? Are you? Did you find yourself uh, sort of restricted or pigeonholed into this goal, so to speak? Uh, the short answer to all those questions right. is no. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the the implication that uh, that uh, because the president said it five years ago, and five years here we are still dealing with Bashar al-Assad, that it was that 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 it was wrong to espouse that view, that it was uh, that it, that it was incorrect to try. Uh, to move uh, Syria to a better place, a, a place that, that doesn't have Bashar al-Assad at the head of the government, is somehow uh, 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 wrong-headed. Is is that that's that's just not that's not the case. And I and I you know I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I also want to point out something else the president said that day. Okay, because I got it in front of me and I kind of figured I might get asked this. He said, for the sake of Syrian people, the time has come for President Assad to step aside. Those were his exact words. And then he went on and said this, the United States cannot and will not impose this transition upon Syria. It is up to the Syrian people to choose their own leaders, and we have heard their strong desire that there not be a foreign intervention in their movement. What the United States will support is an effort to bring about a Syria that is democratic, just, and inclusive for all Syrians. We will support this outcome by uh, pressuring President Assad to get out of the way of this transition and standing up for the universal rights of the Syrian people along with others in the international community. And everything that we've done since then has supported that overarching goal, including the work that Secretary Kerry has, um, has so energetically pursued, not just with Russia, but with all the members of the ISSG, to move Syria to a better place through a political process. Mm -hmm. So what the President said five years ago, you have to take that in totality in all its context, and it still applies today. I understand, but you know, I mean, looking at what's going on in Syria today, the Syrian people's will, so to speak, has really been reduced. And everybody else is playing uh, a role in this thing. There are regional governments, there are, you know, people that are supporting all these opposition groups, others that are supporting the regime and so on. And it seems, you know, this whole process, the Syrian people's will, so to speak, has been really marginal. Well, I'm not going to dispute the fact that, um, uh, that the Syrian people do not have an adequate voice in their future right now. How many of you seen the video today, the, the, the photos of that well, little boy? Now he's about five, five years old. Right. So my, by my figuring, uh, that little boy has never known a day of his life where there hasn't been war, death, destruction, um, and, and poverty uh, in his own country. And you can't, you don't have to be a dad, but I am. And you can't but help him look at that and, and see that that's the real face uh, of what's going on in Syria and that, and that we all have to pull together uh, to try to reach a better outcome, and this notion that that you, you, you that so many people are involved now and it's very complicated, we agree. It's one of the reasons why the secretary is so frustrated by what's going on, on on the ground in Syria, and that's why he continues to urge Russia to work with him on a set of proposals that we agreed to in Moscow and that our teams are still trying to work out to try to get the cessation of hostilities to be more enforceable across the wide expanse of Syria in an enduring way, so that we don't have to look at any more images like the one of that young boy today out of Aleppo. My last question on this, uh, on this issue, your counterpart, Maria Zakharova, today said that you are getting at a critical point, uh, your Russian counterpart, they hold a weekly press conference. She said that uh, you're getting very close to, to arriving at something regarding Aleppo and regarding the ceasefire. Could you share with us anything? Then? I, uh, I would agree with her to the extent that we continue to have um, meaningful conversations about trying to reach agreement on the technicalities of these proposals. Um, I'm not going to be predictive here in terms of outcome or when that outcome uh, might be arrived at, but, uh, but those discussions are ongoing. Um, and, uh, um, and they're, again, proposals that Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, and Secretary Kerry both agreed to you know, some weeks ago uh, in, in Moscow. We are still committed um, to having those discussions and those negotiations and to trying to get those proposals agreed to. Just on the five-year mark issue, then I'll defer to the broader questions about Syria. Presidents in historical terms are judged in large measure on whether they were seen to be shaping events or were in fact continually responding to them. And here we had 
the commander in chief, the leader of the free world, saying that this tin pot dictator across the world must go. He didn't say just that he should step aside. He said he, Assad's days are numbered. Assad must go. And five years later, he's still there. Doesn't that indicate an inability on the part of this president to shape events to his own satisfaction? No, James, I don't think that at all. Um, uh, f so first of all, I mean, I'm no historian, but uh, you're right. The presidents are often measured by what, uh, uh, what proactively they're able to accomplish, but they're also measured by what they respond to and how they react. Uh, and the world keeps turning. And our enemies get votes. Uh, and, uh, and, and things happen that require uh, a measure of responsiveness. And the president has acted assertively here. Uh, and it was, um, uh, you know, we, we were able to get the great, great, the great majority of the stockpile of chemical material out of, of Syria through negotiations, not through force. Um, uh, there's no doubt that uh, by making a concerted decision to act inside Syria militarily, we have put much more pressure on a group like Daesh there and supported uh, those forces on the ground that could be competent against them. And, uh, and the president has, uh, uh, has supported and endorsed uh, a diplomatic approach uh, that the one, the one that Secretary Kerry is pursuing to try to bring about a political solution from the outset. And I read a comment, you know, br briefly, comment from what he said five years ago, from the very beginning, he's been talking about a diplomatic political solution here, that there's not going to be a military solution to the civil war in Syria. So he has been consistent on that, and we have been consistent and concerted in trying uh, to pursue that outcome. Kirby, when, when the president said that uh, five years ago, I think the death toll was maybe 2,000, 3,000. It's now maybe 500,000. So how do you argue that that's assertive action when – he lays out a, uh, you know, an ideal kind of situation where the Syrian president would leave, and five years later, that hasn't happened. But what has happened is, you know, hundreds of times more deaths yeah. than when he said that. Yeah. No. Look, everybody is cognizant of the death and destruction there, Brad, and nobody's happy. No, is that no not failure, though? Utter failure. It is. Uh, it is a failure of Bashar al-Assad. It is Bashar al-Assad who's been killing his own people. It's Hang on a second. The success of Assad. He wanted to kill those people. It's a failure of the people who wanted to stop him. It is a failure of, of whatever, whatever uh, uh, notion of leadership Bashar al-Assad once thought he had, any legitimacy to govern uh, that, he, that he thought he had. He lost that. And now I'm not – and nobody – and you shouldn't take away from anything I'm saying, that we're just – that we're blithely standing by uh, – uh, ignorant of and uncaring of the suffering of the Syrian people. The United States still leads the way in terms of humanitarian assistance uh, and support uh, uh, for, uh, for those Syrians that are fleeing the country. Um, we're getting close now to the President's goal of bringing in uh, 10,000 here uh, into the United States. We're leading the efforts. It was the United States uh, who put together, Secretary Kerry put together the International Syria Support Group and who led the way to get a UN Security Council resolution in place to enact, to put in place a cessation of hostilities. Um, not, not every actor in this um, has acted with the same uh, overarching positive goals for what we want Syria to become. All right, well, that is me. Let, me, let me just ask you about the news of the day then. Um, the 48-hour pause that's been suggested by yeah. the Russian military, do you support that? And are you confident? We would support that? any diminution in the violence. Uh, we would support uh, any efforts the, that would prevent more people from suffering, such as that little boy. Are you in um, Sorry, that Brad. said, that said, Brad, and I've said this before, we really believe it's important to get beyond temporary, ephemeral, and localized ceasefires. Uh, now, uh, we're not going to turn up our nose at, at a genuine effort to stop the bombing, even if it is just for 48 hours. But that's not the long-term answer, and that's not what we're trying to pursue here. That's why, again, it's important for Russia to work with us, and our, our teams to work together to try to uh, come to agreement on the technicalities of these proposals, which if, as the Secretary said, fully implemented in good faith, uh, could allow the cessation of hostilities to be expanded across the country. Do you have any assurances from Russia that if this pause were to come into effect, that that would even mean 
the humanitarian convoys getting into Aleppo and other besieged areas. I, I'm sure you saw that the, the special envoy, Staffan de Mistura, kind of walked out of the meeting today. Yeah, no, I mean, think that's a measure of his frustration, too, and where we're going here with these, uh, uh, with, the, with the fact the humanitarian system is not getting where it needed to be. Uh, it has always been a, a staple of our discussions with uh, the Russians and, quite frankly, with anybody else involved in the, in the effort on Syria that – uh, humanitarian assistance and access has got to be provided. So, so it is part of it is absolutely part and parcel of the discussions that we're having with uh, the Russians. But you don't have any assurance yet that this new window that's being talked about would include that. Uh, I haven't seen anything specific about this window with respect to, to humanitarian access. But Brad, more importantly, that's got to be that's a baseline need. That's not uh, now. Look, if right. if that comes as a part of the forty-eight hour. Ceasefire, again, we're not going to turn up our nose at that. That's a good thing. But it's, it's got to be and always has been, in our view, a foundational element. You have to have it across the board every day. And that hasn't been the case. The regime has been uh, uh, throwing up obstacles, preventing convoys from reaching, or stealing medicine out of them uh, routinely. And then right. lastly, your planning, your planning note on the trip had it kind of abruptly ending in Saudi. Is there any chance the secretary then flies on to Geneva to meet Foreign Minister Lavrov <laughs> I don't, talks uh, about Syria I, thereafter. I don't have. There will be a direct <laughs> flight home. I do not have anything additional on the secretary's schedule to speak to today. Syria? Turkey? Everybody's on Syria? You're on Turkey. We're going to stay on Syria. Go ahead. You on Syria? No, North Korea. No, North Korea. No, I'm looking at that right now. Go ahead. Thank you. So today, uh, the U.S. backed YPG rebels in Syria were bombed by the Assad regime. It was reported by Reuters and other news agencies as well. Do you have any reaction to this? I, I've seen those reports. I can't confirm them. I'm not in a position to do that right now. I think you know that's difficult for me to do on the same day as uh, when operations occur. Uh, uh, but obviously, you know, we're, we're taking it seriously and we're looking at it. Okay. If I mean, I mean, there were videos of the attacks on the rebels by multiple news outlets. Uh, you can confirm later. But if actually they, they came under attack. Would the United States do anything? Because these are the rebels that you've trained, you've provided, you've sent U.S. soldiers to train and advise and assist them. Uh, would you do anything about it? I, I'm not going to get into a hypothetical situation on an attack I can't confirm right now. You're right. We do provide some measure of support to some uh, uh, opposition uh, groups inside Syria, and that support continues today. Uh, but I'm not going to hypothesize about uh, military outcomes one way or the other. I'd refer you to my colleagues at the Defense Department. Obviously, if it's true, it's a clear violation of the cessation of hostilities, uh, and it's one that we're going to continue to try to try to work on. I just don't have a better answer for you than, than that today. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times now this, these images that have gone viral of this young boy. Do you know whether the Secretary has had a chance to review that video and what his – sort of thoughts were on this? I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I've not spoken to the Secretary about the video, so I can't confirm for you that he's uh, actually seen it. Um, I just don't know. Okay. And then sort of beyond any talks of, of a particular agreement with Russia for a 48-hour ceasefire, why is there not being given more consideration to, to providing some sort of direct U.S. government humanitarian assistance to the people in Aleppo and sort of stepping up what the U.S. government is doing on a humanitarian level to assist people there, just given the level of crisis that we're now at? Well, again, we're the largest uh, uh, donor for uh, humanitarian assistance for uh, people in need in, in Syria. Um, this is uh, the, the delivery has been, um, and we believe, important to continue to be led by the U.N., and we support the humanitarian process assistance in Syria through the U.N., but it is the – uh, uh, but it is the uh, the UN uh, that that has in the past taken lead on that, and we think that that's a that's appropriate. Do you think it's appropriate for um, any further agreements with Russia to be preconditioned on them stopping strikes in and around Aleppo? Again, we're in a set of serious discussions right now with uh, uh, with uh, Russian counterparts about Aleppo specifically, but also about trying to get. Um, these proposals in place for a nationwide cessation of hostilities that can actually be uh, enforced. Um, and that means that the, the regime isn't killing innocent civilians and isn't going after opposition groups. And frankly, it also means that the opposition groups uh, are not going to be uh, overtly attacking uh, the regime. So uh, we know we have responsibilities in that regard, as do other nations who have influence over those opposition groups. And we also know 
that Russia has an obligation here, that they have influence over Assad, that when they have chosen to, to use it in the past has worked, um, and, when, uh, and when they don't uh, choose to use that influence, obviously we see uh, scenes such as uh, what we were seeing out, out of Aleppo. Um, so if you're asking me, is there a, a precondition to, uh, to, the, to stopping the violence, absolutely there is, and that has to be, uh, first and foremost, the regime stopping uh, the killing and, and uh, maiming of, of innocent civilians. And then last one, a little bit different. Um, there's some reports out there that another American citizen was killed near Manbij um, fighting with the YPG. Do you have anything on that? I, I've seen reports of it, but I don't have any information on that. Yeah. Now, you began by um, condemning today's PKK terrorism in Turkey, and the PKK attacks now seem to be escalating and becoming more bloody. But at the same time, the Turkish government is using a heavy hand against peaceful Kurdish political activity, including the indictment last week of uh, Salahadeen Demirtas, the head of the HDP, the third largest party in the Turkish parliament. What is your view of this? Do you think that Ankara might be making a serious mistake in denying Turkish Kurds a democratic alternative to the PKK? Well, as I said, we did condemn the violence uh, there in, in Turkey, and I have seen the reports uh, about Mr. Dermatosh, uh, and we are following that issue, that very specific issue. Uh, as we said before, we're concerned by the aggressive use of judicial inquiries to curb free speech and political discourse in Turkey, and we support have and always will support freedom of expression there, and we're going to continue to oppose any action uh, to encroach on the right to free speech. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I have a quote here. Uh, Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Çavuşoglu said, quote, it seems to us that NATO members behave in an evasive fashion on issues such as the exchange of technology and joint investments. Turkey intends to develop its own defense industry and strengthen its defense system. In this sense, if Russia were to treat with this with interest, we are ready to consider the possibility of cooperation in this sector. End quote. Is, there, is that a fair criticism of NATO, and do you think it is a good idea for the NATO ally to cooperate with Russia in the defense sector? Well, there's a lot there. First of all, I haven't seen those comments, but let's put that aside for a minute. Um, uh, Turkey remains a NATO ally um, and an important part, partner in the fight against Daesh, and we expect both those relationships, those multilateral relationships, to continue. Uh, I can't speak for, for NATO, but the United States as a member of NATO has every expectation that, uh, that, that Turkey's uh, membership in the alliance will continue and continue to be important to uh, alliance uh, operations around the world. Um, as for uh, a change or uh, modifications to the bilateral relationship between Turkey and Russia, that's between them. Um, and there's certainly no prohibition against that. There's, uh, there's no reason for anybody to be concerned. We're certainly not concerned uh, that, uh, you know, if, if Turkey and Russia uh, uh, are going to uh, work out a new or different bilateral relationship uh, based on uh, security and defense I issues. That's for them to decide. Uh, we still value Turkey's membership in the alliance. We still value Turkey's membership and contributions as part of the coalition against Daesh. And as I said, we're going to continue to look for ways to, to see that deepen and strengthen. Çavuşoglu also described Turkey as being treated as, quote-unquote, a second, uh, by, by the U.S. and NATO as, uh, quote-unquote, a second-class country. Uh, we hear U.S. officials say uh, Turkey is a strong ally, and there seems to be a disconnect between what U.S. officials say and what the Turkish leadership expresses. Why the disconnect? Well, I can't explain. Uh, first of all, again, I haven't seen those comments, so I'm not going to speak to the veracity of them. Uh, 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 if, if there are views inside Turkey that uh, there's some disconnect, that they can speak to that. What I can tell you from our perspective is uh, what I said before. They're a, a, a valued ally and a partner and a friend. Um, and we want to continue to see Turkey succeed. We want to see uh, Turkey's contributions in the international community on many levels, not just the security sector, but on many levels, uh, continue. Uh, and so we're going to work to that end. Over the past many months, uh, Turkey has accused the U.S. of all kinds of things, including supporting terrorists, including siding with coup plotters. Do you think this is business as usual, or has something changed? What, what business as usual? Turkey making all these accusations, and does this sound like business as usual? Because it, it sounds like you, you're trying to say that everything is normal. No, I but didn't say everything is normal. I said I said they remain a key ally, partner, and friend, and that hasn't changed. I mean, that's what just a fact. Changed? 
That's it. Well, uh, what's changed is Turkey's under a little bit of stress right now, having uh, faced a, a, a failed coup attempt. And, uh, and we've already addressed our concerns about some of the rhetoric coming out from some Turkish leaders um, about, uh, uh, about uh, the role of the West or the role of the, the United States. And we've, we've obviously flatly rejected um, any insinuation or allegation that the United States had anything to do with that. Uh, again, Turkey's a friend and an ally, and we're going to continue to look for ways uh, to, to, to make, uh, you know, to make that partnership continue to grow. But it, we're not doing it with, uh, you know, with a, a blind eye here. We understand that there are, uh, there's a lot of stressors in, in Turkey right now. We want, because we want Turkey to succeed, we're not afraid when we see things that concern us about judicial processes and about freedom of, uh, of the press. We're not afraid to state privately and publicly our concerns uh, because uh, Turkey's future matters so much to us. Iran. Can we go to Iran? Sure. Well, one more on Turkey. Turkey. Um, what is your reaction to Gulen's latest comments likening, uh, sorry, Erdogan's latest comments likening Gulenists or followers of Gulen to those of Daesh? Well, look, uh, as I've made a practice of uh, doing in the past, I'm not going to respond to every single issue uh, raised uh, publicly out of Turkey. I hadn't seen the comments by the foreign minister, um, uh, and while I've seen those comments, I'm not going to respond to every sentence that's uttered out of Turkish leaders. What, what we think would be most helpful is that we, we move beyond issues of rhetoric and try to look for ways uh, uh, to keep the cooperation and the relationship strong with Turkey. Uh, we have already and repeatedly condemned the coup attempt. Uh, we understand Turkey has an obligation uh, uh, to look after its own security. Um, uh, what we've said then and what we continue to say now is that we want Turkey to do that in a way that is in keeping with international law and their own obligations um, uh, and fair judicial processes. So, again, I'm not going to respond uh, uh, to every statement. Um, it's a pretty strong accusation to say the United States is harboring someone like a Daesh leader. I think you know our position on uh, uh, on uh, on their concerns over Mr. Gulen. I think you also uh, know well, and we've made clear uh, 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 our position about uh, what happened in the failed coup and the responsibility for it. Um, I don't have anything more to add to that. In, in fairness, Suzanne, you're not being asked to comment on every statement out of Turkish leaders, just the ones we ask you about. Um, <laughs> But the other ones case, I'm not going to respond to. <laughs> um, on Iran, uh, one assumes that you're familiar with the latest Wall Street Journal report uh, concerning the payment of the $400 million to Iran. Um, is there anything in the Wall Street Journal story that you dispute on factual grounds? <laughs> um, well, look, rather than getting up here, as much as I'm sure you'd love for me to pick apart uh, uh, it's a very simple question. Story. Is there anything you say is untrue in that story? What I would like to do is respond to it this way, okay? Because I, uh, I've seen the article, so let me just uh, let me address this whole issue of uh, of timing this way. We were able to conclude multiple strands of diplomacy within a 24-hour period, and oh, by the way, you can go back and look at the, your own work that was done. Uh, and you'll see that we were completely above board about this. Even the president himself talked about uh, the timing. We were able to con conclude multiple strands of diplomacy within a 24-hour period, including implementation of the nuclear deal, the prisoner talks, and the settlement of an outstanding Hague Tribunal claim, which saved American taxpayers potentially billions of dollars. As we said at the time, we deliberately leveraged that moment to finalize these outstanding issues nearly simultaneously. It's already publicly known uh, that we return to Iran its $400 million in that same time period as part of the Hague Settlement Agreement. With concerns that Iran may renege on the prisoner release uh, given unnecessary delays regarding persons in Iran who could not be located, as well as, to be quite honest, mutual mistrust between Iran and the United States, we of course sought to retain maximum leverage until after American citizens were released. And that was our top priority. Uh, so so was, just, just to return to my question, <laughs> is there anything in the Wall Street Journal story that you dispute on factual grounds? You'd have to, look, I don't have the article in front of me, so I'm not going to go through line by line. 
I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just saying I, I you read the thing. If there's something left out at you that you said, well, that's untrue, you'd be in a position to tell us, wouldn't you? James, I think I've characterized the central finding of the story, uh, which was that the, the, that the payment of the $400 million was not done until after the prisoners were released. I'm not disputing that. Why weren't you able to tell us that uh, 10 days ago when I myself asked the question, can you at least assure us that the, those prisoners were in the process of being released before that money As I said at the time, uh, we weren't in a position then and had no intention of getting into a tick-tock uh, for every movement uh, that happened in that 24-hour period. That's what I answered your question at the time. I think it was me. We answered your question at the time. That was, that was not, never our intention to have to do that. But you're asking me about a press story that's already been written about it that has more detail about it. So I'm providing some context with respect to that. You're but you're changing a little bit because first you said that this was two separate diplomatic tracks. That's what the White House said. That's what the State Department said. Now you're saying that it was used as leverage, which would connect the two. Connect the two. Thank you, Jane. Connect them. They were still. They were independent. Efforts. But you were using one they for leverage together. as a part of the other. No, they came together near simultaneously. And I think it would make sense, perfect sense, that when we're in this moment, it would. It does that make you, sense. if your top priority is to get your Americans out, and you're already having some issues about locating some of them, uh, uh, that you want to make sure um, that, uh, that that release gets done before uh, so you connected. complete that transaction. No, they're connected in the sense that uh, they came together at the same time, and we obviously were making our priority getting the Americans out. And frankly, I think if we had done it if we had done it any differently, then I think you and I and James and I would be having a much different conversation up here, wouldn't we? The payment was contingent on their release. What I'm saying is right. What I'm saying is that. Because we had concerns that Iran may renege on the prisoner release, given unnecessary delays that we were already regarding some persons in Iran, uh, as well as some mutual mistrust, we, of course, naturally, and should be held to ta at task if we didn't, sought to retain maximum leverage until after the Americans were released. That was our top priority. How, can you connect the dots for me? How does the withholding of the cash uh, give you the kind of leverage you were seeking? We, we felt that uh, it would be imprudent not to consider that some leverage in trying to make sure that our Americans got out. So if it has leverage on the release of the Americans, then there's a direct connection between these two events you're now telling us, right? I'm saying the events came together simultaneously. But obviously when you're inside that 24-hour period and you already now have concerns about the end game in terms of getting your Americans out, it would have been foolish, imprudent, irresponsible for us not to try to maintain maximum leverage. Um, so uh, if, if you're asking me, was there a connection in that regard at the end game, I'm not going to deny that. So wait, wait there hold on. Uh, so get, getting away from the word leverage, which um, in basic English, you're saying that you wouldn't give them the $400 million in cash until the prisoners were released, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Is it, is it because the U.S. knew that the Iranians wanted that money at any cost? Uh, I'm not, I can't get inside the Iranian brain here. First of all, remember, it's their, it was their $400 million right. that, that had been awarded to them by the Hague Tribunal. Right. So let's make that clear. Right. Um, and because we already had concerns about the end game in terms of getting our, our people out, mm -hmm. we didn't want to take any chances. And so we believe that uh, as much leverage as could be had, we wanted to have. We wanted to keep as much leverage as possible. We believed that ho holding up that delivery uh, was, uh, was prudent. And, and we have released Americans now. I, I think uh, we can't, we'll never know for sure, but at least we got those, we got those people home. And, and, I, and, and, there's, yeah. and there's no apologies for that whatsoever. Yeah. And wouldn't it be more accurate to say that a ransom is paid and then you get the people back and not the reverse, which is what happened in this case? Well, again, we don't pay ransom, Roz. Right. This, isn't, this wasn't a case of ransom. And again, I need to remind you all, uh, while maybe the little bit of the TikTok here that's driven out 
you, you might find new and salacious. There's really nothing new here in the story about how we got those Americans out and how we leveraged opportunities here that were coming together at the same time. The, you can go back and look at the President's comments and the Secretary's comments when all of this happened. There were opportunities here that we took advantage of, and as a result, we were able to get American citizens back home. Right, but I'm not disputing that you know, your characterization that this wasn't ransom is just that my traditional understanding of ransom was someone is holding someone hostage, says, give me money, I'll give you the person. The money is handed over, the person is then returned. The opposite happened in this case. This was... Which is the U.S. citizens were allowed to leave Iran and then the money from this separate settlement then their was then transferred. Dollars right. Were, was, was provided to them. So yeah, I, I, I don't know how. Like a quid pro quo at all? Yeah, that's, that was my point. Beyond saying there's no ransom, you've said several times a lot of people from different podiums in this government have said there was no quid pro quo. What you just described is by definition a quid pro quo, is it not? No. How is it not? You said they would not get the money until they were released. Quid quo. Thank you for the Latin expert. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what is the that? Latin what am I missing in a quid pro quo that you have just outlined? Brad, they were going to get this money anyway because the Hague Tribunal decided that they were going to get their money back. And no, they hadn't decided. The Hague, there was a, a, a negotiation inside the Hague Tribunal that, uh, that they were going to recover the $400 million principal and then some interest that we negotiated, which saved the taxpayers a lot of money. That process was moving forward, and it was moving forward on an independent track. Separately and distinctly, we were also in talks with them about getting our Americans back. That was also done by a different team uh, and moving forward. Uh, these two tracks came together in a very finite period of time. And it would have been, given the fact that Iran hadn't proved completely trustworthy in the past, it would have been imprudent and irresponsible for us to not, since we, since we knew this payment was coming and coming soon, to not hold it up until we made sure we had our Americans out. Which is why everyone called it a quid pro quo at the beginning, and you disputed that. So I, I don't quite understand how that changes anything. You're saying it would have been imprudent not to link the payment, the delivery of the money, to the release of the prisoners, but you're saying the delivery of the money wasn't a quid pro quo related because, to the release of the prisoners the because there's a backstory. Because the had decided, the negotiation had been settled, that process was moving forward and would have moved forward regardless. But because it all happened in a short period of time, yes, we took advantage of that uh, to make sure we had the, the maximum leverage possible to get our people out so and get them out safely. So it was a quid pro quo? No. You took advantage of it and you made it a quid pro quo? We took advantage of, of, of leverage that we thought we could have uh, to make sure that they got out safely and efficiently. So you were holding the Iranians money hostage? <laughs> no, James. They paid the no, ransom. It's their money. It's their money. <laughs> they they were going to get it anyway. Uh, would, you, but, would you at but, least look, agree, John? Guys, we had to, you know, if we hadn't done that, and if for some reason uh, uh, the Iranians did play games and we didn't get the Americans out, um, and, uh, and we hadn't tried to use that leverage. Then I can understand the disdain and the, and the criticism here. But this was a, this was a sound decision uh, made in the end game of two separate negotiation tracks. I'm, I'm making no value judgment on the decision. I'm, I'm just trying to get you to say what, what it is, which is very simple. I have you, described what it is for the last 15 minutes. But we I don't, haven't used you haven't the Latin for the last you have like, you have not But it doesn't you, mean that I haven't described what happened. Listen, this happened in January and this is the first time you've ever said flat out that they wouldn't get the money until the prisoners were released. That took let's count it. What, 7 months? Why why all the beating around the bush the if it was such a great and, and noble decision? Of press coverage. Bradley, so we evil, said, we said evil reporters wrong. have made you we, dredge this up? No, I've never called you guys evil. I've called you I mean, other you things, can't but blame press evil. coverage because you didn't say what this was seven months ago. We did describe it seven months ago. You did not Brad. say did it was contingent. The, this was we, contingent on that. And now you're saying said, flatly out that... This was this said, payment was contingent on the release of the prisoners. I said you did not was, say that in January. I said this was, as I said before, uh, we of course wanted to seek maximum leverage in this case as these two things came together at the same time. John, you said that you, that everyone all along at all points has been completely above board about this, but you would agree that what you're telling us today represents a new factual disclosure from the administration, does it not? Uh, I, I, 
certainly would agree that this uh, particular fact is not something that we've talked about in the past. Okay. But the, but if you go back and look at the press coverage, your own coverage uh, of this when it happened, nobody made any bones about the fact that these two processes were coming together at the same time, and we took advantage of the opportunity we had with the closure of the nuke deal, with uh, the Hague Tribunal, and with uh, talks to get our Americans back. We took full advantage of that, and I don't think anybody in the administration is going to make any apology for having taken advantage of those opportunities to get these Americans home. And would you agree that a reasonable observer could look upon a situation in which cash is withheld until prisoners are released as something akin to ransom? Well, uh, an observer, whoever he or she may be, can look at this however they want. I've described now over the last 10 or 15 minutes what happened and what our thought process was going through that, and I'll let others decide for themselves. I got to get going. Okay. That. So we need to, sorry, just before we go then, can we talk about Rio? Do you want to, uh, and the U.S. swimmers, do you have uh, any um, statement you would like to provide? What's the latest? Are you encouraging Brazilian authorities to let go, uh, let the uh, U.S. swimmers leave the country? Look, I, I uh, as much as I know you, you'd love me to uh, talk uh, with specifics on this case, uh, I can't do that, Justin. Um, uh, uh, out of privacy considerations, uh, I'm just not at liberty to discuss this. This is for the parties to work out. I've seen the press coverage of it, but I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to uh, uh, give you much more than that. As I think you know, uh, we have a consulate in Rio. We have trained consular officers there around the world, and their job is to is to help us look after uh, the safety and security of Americans uh, overseas. That's uh, that's about as far as I can go. Have they had and consular contact? I, I'm afraid I just can't go into any more specifics about this case. Based on the press coverage alone, which is in depth, I mean, these guys apparently, the Bra Brazilians are saying publicly that Lochte and the swimmers lied about being robbed. D does that, are you worried that that is some sort of embarrassment to the U.S. participation in, in these games? In it. Again, I, I've seen press coverage of, of uh, this uh, evolving case, and I'm not going to comment or characterize it one way or the other. I just can't do that. I've got they, time for one more. Beyond the consular angle of this, can you say whether there have been diplomatic conversations between U.S. diplomats on the ground in Rio and their counterparts, their Brazilian counterparts? Can we get one on Asia? This sure, one. go ahead. Okay. Uh, the Korean Defense Ministry spokesperson said earlier today in a press briefing that they are aware that North Korea has uh, started reprocessing their spent fuel into plutonium. Uh, do you have a reaction, and do you have any update on what the I think my is? colleague talked about this yesterday. I mean, we've seen the reports. I'm not in a position to confirm them one way or the other. If true, it's obviously a violation of UN Security Council resolutions and clearly flies in the face of uh, the DPRK's international obligations, and we would urge them to fulfill those obligations immediately. Thanks. Appreciate it, everybody.